When we first came to Deep Slit, we didn't know what we were going to find. We came here in 2003, and we knew that people were poor here, but we didn't really know how they managed their money. We didn't know if they saved or if they borrowed, or if they somehow insured for different things that might happen to them. We found pretty quickly that they actually managed their money very, very actively. Um, that they did a lot of transactions and in informal instruments. You know, they lent money to each other. They saved in savings clubs. They had different burial societies that they belonged to, as well as also saving in formal banks and formal insurance and taking formal loans. They mixed everything all up together because they had a lot of different risks and a lot of different opportunities that they were trying to take advantage of. People who live here oftentimes have income that's very, very irregular. They don't know where their next job is going to come from. Maybe they're running small businesses and the income comes in and it goes out. Or even if they have regular jobs and their income is more secure, expenditures come up out of nowhere. They might have a funeral to pay for. They might suddenly need to take a child to the doctor. They might suddenly have a fire or something and they need to replace where they live. So they have these unexpected expenditures and sometimes irregular income. That means that they need to manage their money even more actively than a wealthy household. So a lot of times people say, well, if people are poor, they don't need to manage their money. But we actually found that the reverse is true. Because people don't have a lot of money, they need to manage their money much more actively, much more carefully, and across a lot of different instruments. They need to think about these things all the time. In order to understand the financial lives of people living here, we needed to track them very, very closely over a period of time. After all, finance is really a relationship between money and time. And so to really understand how people are managing their money in order to understand their finances, you need to combine the two. You need to look at the money across time. So we tracked about 50 households in this area, in Deep Slit. And we observed them and all the money coming into the household, all the money coming out of the household for one year. At the same time, we were also looking at 50 households in Lunga in Cape Town and also uh, 50 households in the Eastern Cape in the rural areas in a little t village called Lugangeni. So this total sample of about 150 households, we tracked them for an entire year and we took down all of their income flows in, all their flows out and all the ways in between that they managed their money. Our field workers visited them every other week for a year and took meticulous notes of exactly how they managed their money. We got to know these households really, really well. We got to really understand them. We became part of their family in many ways. And as we got to know them a lot better, we started to understand their decision making. And whereas at first it didn't seem to make a lot of sense, as we got to know them, it made more and more sense as time went on. So what we realized is that the poor actually get hit by this thing that we call the triple whammy. We know that they're poor, we know that incomes are low, but then we've also found that incomes are very irregular and you can have a lot of unexpected expenses. But then the last thing is that the financial devices that they use aren't really set up to manage those types of cash flows. So the hidden problem of poverty, the extra problem if you will, is that the poor can't make use of the little money that they have because they don't have the right type of tools to manage that money. So one would imagine that with these really low incomes, you wouldn't have households saving a lot out of them. But we actually found that in South Africa, on average, the households that we tracked in the diaries, households saved about 21% of their income every single month. So they actually had the discipline and the budget to set aside quite a large portion of their money every month. One of the big ways that they used to save that much is savings clubs. What we would call here in, in South Africa, we would call them stockwells or umgalelos. And that's when a group of people got together and they would save together and there would be a specific pattern to that saving. We found that stockwells were really fantastic in getting the money out of the budget on a month to month basis. But what they didn't do as well was allowing households to save for over a year. So to save for the long term or to save for something unexpected. And that's where these portfolios really fell down. People just weren't able to put aside money 
further than how long the stock bill ran. So we found that people using their savings clubs, these savings clubs would last maybe for a couple months, at the most they would last for a year. But once the money came due, once they had that saving up, that lump sum in their hand, most people use it right away on good things, building a house, paying for education. But the point was they weren't really able to make that money last past a year. They didn't have a good financial device to make that money last. So that really helped us redefine the problem of savings. See, it's not really about not having enough money to save. There was enough money to save. It's just that there wasn't the right type of financial tools to allow the poor to take a portion of their savings and put it aside for a rainy day or for the long term. So that really means two things. The channel through which we deliver financial products really matters in this market. It also means that product design really matters. And that's actually quite comforting because it means that we don't have to suddenly really worry about how do we make the poor rich before we offer them financial services. They need financial services now and they can use financial services now. We just need to design them in the right way. We need to use the right mechanisms and we need to use the right product design that fit the cash flows and the circumstances that they really deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. 